Brand new day. Well, thank you, Bethel. It is uh, good to share with you again. My name is Ben. I'm the children's pastor here at Bethel Church. And I actually love the theme that we've had to the start of this year, a brand new day. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of hope for 2024. I have a lot of hope for my family. I have a lot of hope for myself. I have a lot of hope for this church. God is going to do something good. Amen? Uh, Even if today you are seemingly facing challenges more than God's goodness, I have to tell you, I believe God has something good for you today. God has something good for you this year. So let's believe that together. Uh, Let's pray and then we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for your goodness to us. Mm. We depend on you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you glad you came to church? Look at you guys, snow warriors, trekking your way up this mountain to make it to church today. Imagine what you'll be able to tell your grandkids or great-grandkids or great-great-grandkids. I don't know. Back when you used to go to church, it was uphill in the snow, which it probably was for most of you. Both ways, depending, yeah, I guess it could be both ways. Uh, Well, today I want to talk about love. Oh, somebody, a real romantic over there. I admit the topic of love can be a bit of an eye roll. I thought I heard some groans in there too. Uh, You probably already know that God loves you. You probably already understand that we are supposed to love each other, and I get that. Please do not check out, because as with many parts of faith, love is something that we may easily understand, but it can be hard to grasp sometimes. Maybe you might relate to this. You know that God loves you but you feel worthless sometimes. You feel unlovable. Maybe you know that God wants you to love that other person, but you can't because they're so annoying. (laughs) The truth is, some of the seemingly easy things of faith can be very hard when you live life. The truth is, when it comes to others, it is really hard to do in a world where we are all so very different. Amen? In fact, this uh, may also not only be for us individually, but when we think about the church, I have to tell you, the term evangelical Christian meant something completely different 20 years ago than it does today. Historically, the church was the sanctuary for people to come for aid, for help, for comfort, which is not so much the way it is anymore. It's hard to love people. It's hard to love people well. Today, I don't want to talk about the church, though, because it's too comfortable for you guys. I want to talk about you and a little bit about me. Because I think God has called us to love well. Some may laugh at the statement that the church is our world's greatest hope for meeting Christ. You look at what we've been up to in the last so many years, you look at where we've been historically, and you say, wow, we got a lot of problems as a church. Capital C, church, all Christians. I believe that, though. I believe our church is exactly what our nation needs. I believe Bethel Church is exactly what Medford needs in this valley. I believe you are exactly the person who needs to love your family well, who needs to love your spouse well, who needs to love your kids or your grandkids or great-grandkids well. God has put you exactly where you are 
to love others and to love others well. So don't sleep on this one. It seems like an easy concept, but it is super, super, super important, and it is easy to lose sight of. Now, some of you might be asking, well, why is love so important? I'm glad you asked. Uh, Jesus himself tackled this issue many times. In Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus is asked a question from the Pharisees. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Many of you might know his reply. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I mean, what a, what a powerful explanation, right? When asked, what is the most important things that God has given us to follow? What, how can we live our lives in a way that will please God? Jesus' response is, you got to love God with everything. you got to love other people well. How are we doing How are you doing with loving others well? It's the most important thing we get to do. And Jesus has asked us to do it. And we get to do that. But it doesn't stop there. The Apostle Paul said it this way. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a little bit of 12, but then mostly 13. Paul says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mystery and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, And give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then he finishes it in uh, chapter 13, verse 13, by saying, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now we as a denomination or a fellowship, the assemblies of God our church is associated with, we believe that we are dependent upon the Holy Spirit for living. And we hold firm to the fact that God has gifted all of us with abilities and giftings to be used for his service. But I have to tell you, those giftings are worthless if we don't love well. We can have all knowledge. We can know all prophecy. We can speak in tongues. We can do miracles. But if we don't love well, it's useless. It's useless for our world. It's useless for the community. It's useless for each other. It is the most excellent way. It's that important. That we love each other well. Now, <clears throat> we talk about love. I want you to do it well, but I also want to give you some help. So we're going to talk a bit about how we love, who we love, and a little bit about what might get in the way when we're trying to love others well. Uh, I want to start today with who do we love? Who are we supposed to love? Jesus, he did say it was the most important thing, had quite a bit to say about this, uh, and he helps us a bunch. Now, uh, we already talked about it in this chapter in Matthew 22. It says, love the, Jesus replied with the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then it goes on, 
And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to love well, you have to love yourself, which is both easy and super hard. It's easy to love yourself by calling in for a mental health day and saying, ah, I needed a break. Uh, It's easy to love yourself by going on vacation. It's easy to love yourself by getting a delicious treat because you've earned it. Uh, Those are easy ways to love yourself. It can be really hard to love yourself when you know deep down who you are. You've lived with yourself. You know what you think about. You know what you desire. And our temptation can become self rejection, that we reject our own worthiness, our own lovability. We reject ourselves. And I have to tell you, church, I don't think the enemy has a greater tool to use against you than to have you reject the fact that you were created in God's image, that you were gifted, you were gifted gifted gifts from the Spirit of God who has a plan and a purpose for your life that is so rock-hard foundational that regardless of where you are and what you've been up to, you can still achieve that. God has you, and He loves you. If you want to love well, you got to know God loves you. That has to be the core of who you are. And you got to agree. <laughs> you can't just know God loves you and hate yourself at the same time. You have to reconcile that. I'm going to give you a moment tonight, today. It could go long. We could be still be here tonight. I don't know. As the Spirit leads. Let's just say today. I'm going to give you a moment tonight <laughs> Today, Uh, I'm going to give you a a moment today to pray if you need to do that, if you know you need to get on the same page with God here because you've been thinking the thought process in your mind is only pushing you down. It's not putting you up as the literal apple of God's eye, the person that he went to the cross for that he loves. What makes this, I think, hard for most of us are things like social media. What a gift from technology. Oh, boy. Social media makes it real hard sometimes. When you see how other people are living their lives, you can get real judgmental towards yourself. You be careful there. We live in a performance driven society where your greatest gift is production. What you can do. Man, that doesn't fit with what God says about you. It has nothing to do with what you do. He doesn't love you because you're great. He doesn't love you because of what you can give to him. He doesn't love you because you live a pure life. He loves you because he chose to love you and he does not change. He will continue to love you regardless of your devotion to him. He will continue to love you no matter what. His love for you is strong. And you can rest in that. And I have to tell you when we're talking about loving yourself, you have to rest in that. It also doesn't help thinking of some of our kids today that every generation seems to take turns putting down the generations that come after them. Isn't that crazy? I mean, you guys remember growing up. When you were younger, didn't it seem like people were always picking on you and didn't like the way you were wearing your jeans or the haircut you had or something, right? 
And yet the same is often true for our kids today. Wouldn't it be awesome if this church was different than that? If this church lifted up the generations coming behind them, knowing that they were the future of the church. And that you knew they needed to understand that God loved them. And that you could play a role in that. Insert children's ministry pitch. (laughs) You can. (laughs) Today. It's funny, I do laugh. But the truth is our kids need to know about Jesus. Jesus. And they can't do it if there's not somebody in that classroom. If you are at all interested in getting involved with the next generation, please come talk to me. I'd love to have you with our young adults. I'd love to have you with our youth. Love to have you in our kids' ministry, our promised land ministry. You may not have skills. That's okay. We can work with that. And it's a good place to be. Amen. All right. So who do we need to love? Got to love yourself. But Jesus didn't stop there. Uh, One of my favorite passages in the Bible, our favorite Bible stories, is in John chapter 13. And I'm going to read a little extra here. Uh, Starting in verse 1. Starting in verse 1, it says this. It was just before the Passover festival... Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. So he got up, from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then it goes on in verse John, uh, John 13, verse 35. By this, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is a pretty incredible story. And I love the way that John tells it in this gospel. He says right here in in verse uh, three, Jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power. That he was chief among creation, that he was ruler of the world and the universe. He understood this. He understood that he came from God and was returning to God. And then verse 4 says, so he got up and then went and washed his disciples' feet. I don't know about you, but if there was some miracle and I was allowed to switch places, it was like a trading places thing, and me and Jesus just switched spots and time and space for a moment, and I had the realization that I was in charge of everything, I don't know that my first response would be, oh, duh, I'm in charge of everything. Hold on, let me get up. Let me start washing your guys' feet. (laughs) Some of the sinners laughed over here because they know. They know. (laughs) That's probably, what would I do first? Revenge on my enemies. (laughs) That's not what you were thinking. I totally get that. But... Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus understood fully who he was, but he didn't miss the moment to serve. He says, by this, you will know, or by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You need to love each other. 
It's important. How we interact, it's super important. Does that mean it's going to be easy? No. I mean, just in the term church family, you already know it's going to be hard because family's tough. Family can be very difficult sometimes. But are we supposed to work with each other? Has God put it together so that we can support one another, so we can serve each other? Yeah. Yeah. We need to serve each other. But Jesus goes on from there. This is from uh, the book of Luke. I'm just going to read. I brought my Bible up here to look impressive. I hope it's working. It's a very very big Bible. Um, Jesus tells this story of the Good Samaritan. It says, on an occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, this is Jesus replying. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the guy had been listening. You have answered correctly. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus tells the story of the good Samaritan. Now, many of you might have heard this story before. It basically goes like this. A Jewish man was traveling down the street. If this were kids' ministry, I would call on some of you to come up and act this out, but... I was just telling Chrissy I got demoted and I had to come up to adult church to talk to the dumb adults. I'd rather be downstairs with the kids. I actually didn't say that. Well, I did, but I didn't say dumb. I just added that. Because you guys aren't dumb. You're awesome. So this Jewish man comes. He gets beaten mostly to death and he's left on the side of the road. As the story tells out, several Jewish people come by. They see the man and they pass by him, right? They had the chance to help this man, but again, it goes as far as pointing out that some of the church leaders had the opportunity to help, and they cross to the other side of the road and then just keep walking. A little bit convicting personally. It's a Samaritan. And Jesus crafts the story well because he knew that Jewish people and Samaritan people were not on the same page at all at this point in history. In fact, They hated each other. They were not even able to talk in public together because of how different they were, right? It's just the world they were living in at the time. But as Jesus tells a story about who is your neighbor, it's the Samaritan who comes, picks the man up, takes him to a place to get bandaged up, pays for all the expenses, and then checks back in on him after he's returned from his journey. I don't know if there's a person that exists in our world that makes you uncomfortable. But as I read this, it's hard for me not to apply that Jesus is saying that that person is your neighbor. That that person is someone that you should love. As in the greatest commandment, which is what he's talking about here. That it doesn't just fit people who think like me, people who go to church with me, but it's also those who think nothing like you, those who don't go to church with you. Maybe even that one person who just makes a comment on Facebook that makes you go, oh, even them. That is who God has asked us to love. And just to be clear, Jesus does go on in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, to say this. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So there's no confusion. 
when we're talking about loving others, we're talking about humanity. We're talking about all of us. It's so mm, human for you to think of yourself as above somebody else. I'm trying to use my words clearly. That, that's not God's way. But that's so natural for us to do. And Jesus is trying to bring us all back to the foot of his cross and saying, <laughs> you may see a great difference between you and the sinner on the street. But in comparison to who God is, you're much closer to that person than to God. You have much more in common with the pagan than with Jesus. Now, we're working toward that. We're trying to be more like Jesus. But it doesn't give us a place to look down on the rest of humanity. We're here to love others and love them well. You got to love yourself. We got to love each other. We got to love people who don't think like us. In fact, we got to love people who don't like us. And we got to love them well because it's the greatest thing we can do. There's not much room here to wiggle on. Jesus talks about this a lot. We're supposed to love each other. Now, this is difficult, right? <laughs> That's seemingly obvious. We all struggle with loving people. Even the Apostle Paul. This is Romans chapter 7, a bit of 18 and 19 says this. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. This is the Apostle Paul. For context, he wrote half of the New Testament that we have. Chris can fact check me on that. I don't know word for word. It's a lot. He wrote a lot of the letters that are in the Bible. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do what is good, the good I want to do. But the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. We are imperfect, to put it lightly. And it is hard to get along sometimes. The things we want to do, we don't do. And the things that we know are evil, those are the things that we often do. Now, maybe you're having trouble thinking of that in that context, but if I think the Apostle Paul struggled with that, I got to think in some ways I must struggle with that too. So the question is, how can we love well? We're going to get to that in a minute. But first I want to answer, why do we not love well? What is the problem? What seems to get in the way? Well, the women's Bible study is working on this. But I think one of the first things is offense. Getting offended makes it really hard to love somebody else. And to put it another way, when somebody hurts you, it's really hard to love them. Now, I want to put some guardrails in like right away. For the relationship, I'm not saying that if somebody is physically or emotionally or mentally, spiritually abusing you, hurting you, that it is your Christian duty to stay in that situation. That's not what I'm saying. We could talk about that much longer. If you are in that situation, we would love to counsel you and work with you through that situation. But what I am saying, <laughs> I know, if, I don't, don't want to say the person's name because they're related to me, but I know a person <laughs> who every time I talk about First Assembly in Albany, which is what it was when I went there, now it's called Hope Church, every time I mention it, he brings up the fact that he went and tried to shake Pastor Lou's hand after service and Pastor Lou passed him by, shook this guy and then passed him and shook the other. And he brings it up every time I talk to him. It is easy to be slighted by a person and never 
let it go. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about we need to let some of these offenses go. It brings up another one of those super easy things to understand but really hard things to do, which is forgiveness. Man, that can be hard. But when you are living with offense in your heart and living with a fresh wound that you keep ripping open so you can remember how angry you are, it's really hard to love people. It's really hard to love people well. It takes a ton of courage, humility to walk through that, but it has been done and it can be done by you and you can walk through that. And if you want to love well, that, that may be something you need to do. Whether that be with your spouse, whether that be with your kids, someone from church, someone from work, we're called to love well, we need to do it. And sometimes that means we got to let go of some of the hurts that we've been carrying with us. All right, another thing that gets in the way, I don't really know how to say this, so I just put being suffocated by life. It's like uh, fatigue, right? One of the examples that I think about is during COVID, it wasn't like for at least for my family, that there was any one restriction that made life impossible, but it was that there were a thousand restrictions that then it finally hit you. My wife, bless her, was in the grocery store and during the pandemic, it was wild, right? We all remember that. And she just comes back crying and she doesn't do this. So I'm like, what what the heck's going on? She just said, "I, I don't know. It, it really, it was so much stress. And then she went to go get a peanut butter or something and there was none. And it just all of a sudden hit her. That there was so much fatigue in her life that it was consuming everything. I think about this. I think about uh, my own house. Your own house can be suffocating the life, right? I'm not gonna Marie Kondo you. But you might need to get rid of some stuff, okay? Sometimes the stuff we have chokes life from us. It's all of these things that we now have to take care of and to uh, manage that seem to suck the ability for us to care about others in our life. Stress. If there's one thing that can suck love away, it's stress. When you are feeling it all on you, our minds just go to survival. And it is really hard to think, to think like a man who was about to go to the cross and who fully understood who he was in time and space and history, that he would take that moment to wash his disciples' feet. It's hard for us when we're feeling all that stress. But we do want to love well. And we do want to love the way Jesus loved. And so I can't tell you how to fix your stress. But sometimes that means you might need to readjust some things. Get back to a space where you can operate. If you have a fear of conflict like myself... That might mean you need to stay off social media, especially with an election coming, because you're going to read something that's going to stress you out for the whole day. Uh, That's a piece. That's a piece of suffocation of life, fatigue. Another thing that gets in our way, and I mentioned this earlier, but I got to mention it again, because I do want to give you time today to talk to God about this, is self-rejection. If you can only see the worst in you. It is really hard to love other people. And I'm not talking about being giving. You know, sometimes people like to push themselves down so they can, they can serve others. I'm talking about really loving others well. 
beyond, I mean, even in the Apostle Paul, if you remember what he said, and he talked about prophecy, he talked about uh, words of knowledge, he talked about speaking in tongues, and then he throws in this thing, even if I were to sell everything I owned, it would still be useless, that there is a way, and some of you know you could do this, you could be so sacrificially giving and still not really be loving, that there's a piece to that that you still wouldn't accept yourself for who you are. Accept yourself for the beautiful creation that God has made you in. You gotta love yourself. Uh, two more and they go together. Inconvenience. Whew. It's not everywhere in our world, but it is in the United States. We love convenience. And the thought that you taking 15-minute detour in your day to go bless another person sometimes feels like not even an option, like not even something you could consider driving a different way home to go stop by somebody's house or taking the moment to just send a person a text, right? It's an inconvenience, not something you're going to think about. Uh, the other one is distraction. This kind of goes into that suffocating of life. We like to fill our lives up, like super full. In fact, a lot of us take pride that we're doing so much we can produce all of this. It is a trap when we don't leave margin for loving our neighbors, that we don't leave room to love other people. I want to invite the worship team up close. So worship team, you can head up. And that is how do we love? We know who we need to love. We know why it's important, hopefully. We have an understanding of what can get in our way. Where do we start? Well, I have five ideas. These aren't from the Bible, so you can ignore these. But I, I thought they were good. The first Give something away. Now, for some of you, that's going to be, phew, I'm a scholarship, a kid for summer camp when that comes around. And you should scholarship a kid for summer camp. That would be wonderful. Uh, but you could just financially help somebody. I'm going to help somebody who needs it, right? Awesome way to give. You might have something that you know would bless somebody else. Give it away. It's a great place to start putting our possessions, those things that we have, under the authority of loving other people, under the authority of Christ, that those are God's things, not ours, that we could steward them that way. Give them away. Second would be spend time with others. What a valuable thing you have, your very own presence. Now again, some of you may not be thinking that way. You may be thinking, who would even want to eat or drink with me? That is a lie. You have so much to offer. And when we live life together, we can see the beauty of the body of Christ. Give something away. Spend time with somebody. Third, serve other people. I love that story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. I would love it if all of you signed up for children's ministry. We would find a spot for you. But serve somebody. We actually have a team here at Bethel called the Axe Serve Team. That team gets an email when we have a need. Sometimes it's been a family has come in and they need food, they need provisions. Sometimes it's been a family needs help with a project in their house. We've done a ton of projects over the last 18 months. If you are interested in being on that team, all you're doing is saying, I just want to know. I can choose to come or not come. I just want to know when there is a need. Grab one of those connect cards Write your information on the back of it in the prayer section. You don't have to cross out prayer. We'll know it's you. Uh, and just say, I want more information on that Acts Serve team because we want you to serve. It's good for you. 
It's good for me. It's good for me when I serve. Another way, I have two left. You can pray for other people. We had someone come up and pray for our nation today because God put it on our heart. I hope you're praying for our nation. I hope you're praying for our governor. I hope you're praying for our future pastor whenever they come to Bethel. I hope you're praying for Pastor Roger. He's leading this church right now. Pray for each other. It's powerful. And it molds your heart. It keeps you soft. It's really hard to hate the person that you're praying for. Please pray for each other. And the last, just let somebody know that you love them. Send them a text. Write them a card. Give them a phone call. Maybe even right now, the Lord just put somebody in your mind. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Act on that, right? We have so many ways to communicate today. Use them. Find a way to let somebody know you care about them. It's powerful. I want to give a response for two people today. The first person is that person who doesn't feel loved. Who doesn't feel God's love because they don't think they're worthy of it. I don't know if this is a verse that I put up there, but it's Romans 5, 8. And it says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not wait for you to be perfect to love you. He loves you right now. Whether you sit in your seat or you come up here to the altar, don't leave today without talking to God about that. Let him know you need to feel his love today. Let them know that you need a reminder later this week that you are loved by the creator of the universe. And he loves you so very much. The other person I want to pray for is the, if you think you need help loving other people. Maybe it's your spouse, your kids, again, family, friends, people you know, people you know disagree with you, people you don't like, people you like. Let's love them this week. Maybe give them something. Maybe send them a word. Maybe invite them to coffee. Maybe reconnect. Let's love them this week. Now, whether you take this moment personally or together as we sing a song here at the end, don't leave today without knowing that God is on your side, that he is for you, that his strength is your strength, and that he loves you so very, very much. Would you pray with me, church? And then stand up. Lord, thank you for your goodness. We know that we only love you because you love us. Thank you for loving us, Lord. We know we haven't always been easy to love, but we rest in the fact that you still love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.